All living beings have to die. That is one of the inescapable truths of existence. Nonetheless, the biological obligation of every living being is to fight with all its strength to delay that moment for as long as possible. That is why the vast majority of wild animals never make it to old age. The slightest weakness and they will fall victim to hunger, predators or parasites. The life force refuses to admit defeat like this mother who refuses to accept that her child died days ago. Death, however, also generates life. Faced with death, animals try to control the where and the how, but we human beings also ask ourselves why and where to. Human attitudes to death are entirely cultural concepts, as is demonstrated by the many widely varying responses of different civilizations in the course of the history of mankind. What lies on the other side? Everyone asks themselves this as we approach old age and the endless night. Some then become obsessed with the other life, while others simply prepare to die as best they can. Many believe they will return in other forms, and just as many believe they will be rewarded. In any case, not even the most powerful of the survivors of the planet Earth can escape the great journey. On the surface of the earth and in the sea, an endless energy war is being fought. All living beings need energy in order to maintain their vital functions. The plants obtain it from the sun and the soil, vegetarian animals steal it from the plants when they eat them, and the predators in turn take it from these by hunting them. But in order to seize the energy from another living being, it is almost always necessary to kill it. The system is based on the fact that all living matter is composed of the same basic components. Arranged in one way, they form a tree. Placed in another way, they are an iguana. And structured in a third way, they are a black jaguar. When the black jaguar eats the iguana, it is stealing its basic building blocks in order to incorporate them into its own body and so continue living. In reality, the iguana dies only as an individual because in terms of energy and matter, it continues to live as part of the jaguar. Therefore, the death of an animal is, in ecological terms, no more than a transfer of matter and energy from one organism to another. The prey must try to avoid this, while for the predator it is a trade-off, a deal from which it must gain in energy terms. If hunting the iguana and defending it from competitors uses up more energy than that to be gained from eating it, he's not interested. The problem for many species is that everyone wants to eat them. 
There are branches of the animal kingdom, such as the rabbits or the rodents, for example, which, due to their intermediate size and abundance, are constantly under the threat of being captured on land, in the sea, and in the air. The biologists call this being at the base of the ecological pyramid, but to you and me it's simply living dangerously. This rodent is called a hutia, and in these wetlands on the island of Cuba, it forms part of the daily menu of its neighbors, the crocodiles. For the hutias, risking their lives every time they come out is perfectly normal. They have to constantly cross the channels in order to carry out their daily activities. Humans in a similar situation would suffer from unbearable stress, but for this type of species, living with death is routine. Animals do not fear death, for that would prevent them from living. They simply seek to avoid it as much as possible, and success as a species means at least as many being born as those that die. True death, in genetic terms, is extinction. We may be surprised at how unperturbed the hutia is by the constant presence of bloodthirsty killers, but it's not much different from the average citizen's attitude to traffic accidents. Like us, this hutia simply thinks it won't happen to him. In reality, the crocodile hasn't seen it, yet. Now the important thing is to remain calm. It escaped this time, but it and its fellow hutias will have to cross the trunk several times a day. The life expectancy of a hutia in captivity is three years, but here in the wild virtually none reach that age. Until the instant before being devoured, a hutia is a perfectly happy creature. They do not live tormented by the threat of dying at any moment. They simply don't think about it. They fulfill their biological obligation and are a successful species, because for each one that dies, three or four are born. Nature has compensated by making them very prolific. Otherwise, they would have disappeared entirely from the face of the earth a long time ago. Unfortunately, for many human beings in the third world, death is an all too constant reality. Extreme poverty generates malnutrition and illnesses which claim the weakest. In this village in the Ivory Coast, Africa, a 10-year-old child has just died, victim to malaria. The entire village unites in cries of pain and calls to God. In this part of Africa, death has a very different meaning from the usual one. They believe that the spirit of the deceased passes into a parallel dimension, a world existing alongside our own. But first, it has to know it is dead, so it will leave and not disturb the living. That is why they have to shout and dance in its honor. The music will tell the spirit of the child that it must now go.
As well as in our perception of death, human beings are different from the majority of animals in another regard. We have a long life ahead of us after having reproduced. This means that old people play a social role even when they are no longer fertile. This characteristic is also shared by the chimpanzees, the gorillas, the elephants and the whales, all of them intelligent social animals. For this reason, non-industrialized societies venerate the old for their accumulated wisdom and organize great celebrations in their honor when they die. Possibly nowhere else in the world are there such complicated and costly funerals as those organized here for the deceased of the local nobility. We are in Sulawesi in Indonesia and the dead man an old, much-loved noble. In reality, he died three months ago, but he has remained embalmed in his home until his family managed to get enough money to organize the funeral. Now everything is ready, and he is carried amid an atmosphere of celebration to a new village which his family has constructed in order to house the almost 2,000 guests who will attend the funeral. Meanwhile, a local artisan is working hard to finish a wooden bust of the deceased, which they call a Tao Tao, in time to be placed alongside those of other dead on the nearby cliffs. The Tao Tao are dressed in the clothes of the dead person and even wear wigs made from their real hair. Children who die before their teeth grow are buried in trees like this one because they still belong to nature, and along with the tree they will reach heaven. The humblest people are laying beneath the cliffs, but space for the niches is in short supply, and the oldest bones are gradually scattered around the area. When the funeral cortege arrives at the new village built for the occasion, the four days the event will last begin. The funeral must be ostentatious so that the soul of the deceased is happy and from heaven will continue to protect his family. The over 2,000 guests come from all over Indonesia, Borneo, Java, Flores, Sumatra, Bali, and are welcomed by three dancers who announce where each group has come from. They all bring offerings for the deceased and compete in quantity and quality to demonstrate the wealth of their clan. The government of the country has placed limits on these extravagant gifts because in the past they could ruin entire families. They file past the family while outside the party continues. After three days sacrificing and eating the animals, the coffin is finally carried to the cliffs, which will be the deceased's final resting place. Guests are Christian, but in their own way. They have combined Christianity with their ancestral beliefs, creating their own entirely original religious syncretism. It will take the family years to recover economically. This human obsession with associating death with earthly possessions, linking the success of the great journey to the objects and persons with which the deceased will be buried, has been a constant in many major cultures in history. 
The Mochica chiefs in Peru were buried along with their wives and servants in great complexes full of gold objects and food. The great lord lay surrounded by those close to him so they would accompany him on the road to eternity. For the great leaders who believed they were related to the divinity, it was very difficult to accept that death would claim them just like everyone else, and so they sought to mark their graves with superb tombs. At least, these were much more spectacular than those of the common people. The so-called animist religions have a somewhat different vision of death. The word animist comes from anima, that is soul. For them, these souls or spirits of the dead do not go far away, but rather remain around us, influencing the daily lives of the living. A man has died in Haiti, the country of voodoo, a religion born from the combination of Catholicism with ancestral African rites. Immediately, the most African part of the funeral begins, a true celebration in which the participants must stay up all night, dancing and drinking alongside the spirit of the deceased. Followers of voodoo do not consider themselves a separate religion, but rather Catholics with certain unique characteristics. One of these is the so-called family spirits, who must be attended to and who protect the members of their lineage. <laughs> The next day, the funeral takes on a more conventional appearance, but the voodoo rites are never far from the surface. They call the place where the material and spiritual worlds come together, the crossroads. The invisible ones are the spirits, always the mediators between the one and only God and man. The domestic worship of the spirits of family ancestors is the basis of voodoo. At the other side of the world, in New Guinea, live the Kukukuku, a fierce people who, until 15 years ago, habitually practiced cannibalism. The Kukukuku have a place called the Sacred Rock, where they lay the bodies of their illustrious dead after having subjected them to a process of smoking for five months or so. In this way, the dead can continue to see their possessions and watch over their former community. Only chiefs, great warriors, and on occasions, young women with their babies are chosen to be placed on the sacred rock. In the past, as soon as they died, their bodies were placed in a sitting position in the kitchen by the fire. When they began to give off the stench of decay, their wives removed the skin by rubbing furiously and took out their entrails to be eaten by the closest relatives. Nowadays, this ritual is still practiced, though only by a small minority. This is just one more example of how, for many peoples on Earth, death is not something terrible, something which may not be spoken of, but rather a part of daily living, something inherent in the very essence of human life. Nature too, the dead also have their funeral guests. Animals specialized in dealing with dead bodies in honoring those who have passed on. In reality, it is an efficient waste disposal service provided by the inventors of recycling. Aerial loops mark the beginning of the ceremony. 
This is a signal to distant vultures that there's work for them here. The entire community of vultures answers the call. Their visual information network covers hundreds of square miles. When one of them finds a dead body, it informs the others by flying around in circles. If the prey is large and has not been torn apart by a carnivore, it can be very difficult for them to get at the insides. But once opened, the skeleton will be stripped clean in just a few minutes. Vultures' stomachs are capable of digesting meat in an advanced state of decomposition, which others would reject. In this way, they reintroduce the matter and the energy of this dead body into the cycle of life. The speed and efficiency of their work avoids the accumulation of decomposing matter on the ground, removing the danger of transmitting infections to living animals. The scavengers are nature's public cleaning services. As we said before, in a natural system, no one truly dies if his genes live on. A gene is a unit that survives through a great number of successive bodies and individuals. Genes must remain through the ages. They are inhabitants of geological time. We living beings are merely their means of survival. And so the genes of these salmon lead them to the river in which they were born, to carry out what at first sight would appear to be a terrible sacrifice, to die in order to reproduce. Their bodies are rotting alive. But the genes know what they are doing. In the process they will win, and the salmon that are born will be much more numerous than those that die. Even discounting those devoured by predators on the outward and return journeys, the lost eggs and the fry that never reach adulthood. The net result is positive. If it were not, these salmon would become extinct, and that is the real death from the biological point of view. The individual doesn't matter. The genes are the important thing. The annual odyssey of the salmon, which to us seems so impressive, a story with a moral, a metaphor of life and death, is in fact no more than an act as natural as a gazelle taking flight when attacked by a lion. The salmon do not know they are going to die. That is not their intention. And so they struggle to the very end. The life force lives on inside their wrecked bodies, though the true hope for their lineage lies in the pink eggs pulsating on the river bottom. The bodies of the brave salmon bring life to the interior of Alaska. Their putrefaction will feed their own children when they are born. They bring energy from the sea and give it to the creatures of the continent. The eggs they have deposited are their genetic legacy, eternal life. Individuals come and go. They are merely tears in the rain. <laughs>